another year older. We all have a birthday of sorts at the same time on New Year's Day. And some folks gather to celebrate and ring in the new year by staying up till midnight. Uh, others, like myself, ring in the new year by doing the same thing we're always doing at midnight every other night, and that's sleeping. But, you know, we all pause, either the 31st or the 1st. We all pause and we stop and we think and reflect on the year past. And, and then also keeping one eye on the future, you know, the possibilities that, that the new year holds. But we are all one year older. You know, for believers, uh, Christians, another year older really isn't a big deal. Oh yeah, we start getting advertisements, promotion mail, promoting uh, uh, supplements that'll help your hearing, supplements that'll help your, your eyesight, and you wonder how in the world you got on that mailing list for a motorized scooter. <laughs> Why are they sending this stuff to me? I'm not old, but we all get another year older. For Christians though, that, that means another year closer to being with our Lord. For unbelievers, on the other hand, non-Christians, another year older is a big deal, especially as the years start passing by. And all of a sudden, the reality of their mortality starts to sink in. I'm not going to live forever unless I do something about it. And then we have cloning coming in where, you know, at one point I thought that cloning would never be possible. But they're getting close. They're getting real close to at least twinning. And, you know, if you could take your own cells and, and duplicate a twin of yourself, but in a younger format, in a way, you would be extending your life, you know. Uh, the flesh life, that is to say. And then you've got what? Cryogenics. That's the science of freezing uh, matter below, I mean, really, really cold. We're talking minus 238 degrees Fahrenheit for cryopreservation. But that's where you know they figure, well, if I freeze myself or I won't get older, by the time science develops and can develop a new body for me or eternal flesh for me, then I'll have them thaw me out and I'll be good to go. Just better hope that they don't drop you. <laughs> <laughs> Might be like little marbles running all over the place at that temperature. And then they have the budget plan for that too, you know. If, if you can't afford to do your whole body, they have the budget plan. They just do your head and, and they figure out that, you know, by the time science develops, they can build a new body for you. All, all you need is your head and your brain. So that's pretty desperate. And, but, you know, it's nothing new under the sun. Man has always tried to create his own salvation, his own eternal life in the flesh. Let's begin our study today in Genesis chapter 11. One of the first examples of men trying to create their own salvation. We ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name as always, Father. We ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. Genesis chapter 11, verse 1, and it reads, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. Everyone spoke the same language at this point in time. I believe it was the same language that, uh, that Jesus and, or I should say, the disciples spoke on Pentecost Day. And the same language that you, God's elect, will speak when you're delivered up before the Antichrist. That's a language that everyone understands. Verse 2, And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. The land of Shinar, if you translate it literally, means the country between the two rivers. And we're talking about the Euphrates and the Tigris, Babylon, uh, Iraq of today. And they said one to another, go to or, or come now. Let us make brick 
and burn them thoroughly. This hardens the, the material. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. Now, now this area has no stone of its own is the reason they're having to make bricks. The slime in the Hebrew, check it out, is kamar. And it's similar to bitumen, which is an ingredient in asphalt today. And they used it like cement to hold the bricks together. What are they going to build? And they said, go to or come now. Let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. We'll find the gates of heaven and walk right on in. And let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Now it helps to understand that this is 150 years after the flood of Noah's time. So the thought that God could create, and although God had promised, I will not flood the earth again. And he gave us the rainbow as a sign of that fact that he would not flood the earth again. But there is another flood coming, and you know what it is. It's the flood of Satan's lies. But what you've got here is 150 years after the flood of Noah's time, they're saying, well, let's build a stairway where we can walk to heaven in case there's another flood. We don't want to die if there's another flood. We'll create our own salvation. There is only one creator and only one salvation. Verse 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men had builded. And he's not happy with them at all, trying to create their own salvation. And you know, when he sees people trying to create their own eternal flesh life by cloning or cryogenics, He's not happy either. And, you know, this is what will bring God down. And, and I think there's a point that he will come down in the future. And you know when that is, is when he returns as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Verse 6. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one. They're, they're united. And they have all one language. And this they begin to do. They build this tower, the Tower of Babylon, which means confusion. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. If, if they'll try and build a stairway to heaven, there's nothing that they won't try and do. Even cloning or cryogenics. Go to... Let us go down. Who is God saying, let us go down? It's the same us he was talking to in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, where he said, let us make man in our own image. The angels, of course. Let us go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. And that's when the seven basic language groups came into being, and that's developed into dozens and dozens and dozens of languages that we speak now on earth. Let me ask you this, something to think about, and don't ask me to document this, but I just want you to, to, to think about it. What is it that allows people to speak that language that everyone understands? The Holy Spirit, right? Could it be that God came down and took the Holy Spirit away from these people temporarily because they had gone against his will and, and building the stairway to heaven? Something to think about. Verse 8, So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of the earth, and they left off to build the city. They quit building the city and the tower. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, or confusion, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. He put a stop to it. But man, trying to create his own salvation by building that tower that he could climb up to the gates of heaven and walk right on in. You know, God promised longevity as a reward. Turn with me to 1 Kings. 
as we continue our study on another year older. First Kings, let's go to chapter 3, pick it up with verse 5. Now, Solomon has just become the king of Israel. First Kings 3, 5. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. This would be one of 20 recorded appearances by the Lord while someone was in their sleep. This is the first of two that the Lord would visit Solomon in his sleep in a dream by night. And God said, ask what I shall give thee. God was pleased with, with Solomon. And, and he's saying, what, and let me ask you this, what would you ask for if God said, ask what you will of me? I'll take a lesson from Solomon, verse 6. And Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy. This is bounty or loving kindness. According as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. Heart can also be translated mind. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And that promise to David uh, from the time of Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 7, I think it's verse, well, 1 Samuel chapter 7, where God visited David and said, I will establish your house forever. And of course that consummated in Jesus Christ, Messiah, who was uh, out of the root of Jesse, which was David's father. A visit from the Lord, though, would be quite a humbling experience. And, and, and Solomon is going to be humble at this point in his life. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father. And I am but a little child. I'm, I'm a young man. At the time he took over the throne, Solomon would be about 19 years old. I know not how to go out and come in. This is a figure of speech that means I don't know how to go about the daily activities of being the king. Solomon is abasing himself and he's going to be exalted. And if you exalt yourself, prepare to be abased. Verse 8. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people. We see the humility of Solomon here. He didn't say my people, as a king might say, he says, thy people, referring to God's people, which thou hast chosen a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. That promise to Abram, who would, God would name Abraham, that his, the, the seed out of his loins would grow to be more numerous than the sands of the sea, than the stars of the heavens. It was that being fulfilled. Verse 9, give therefore thy servant an understanding heart. This word understanding in the Hebrew is shama. It means hearing, but, but even more than hearing, it means hearing with understanding. You know, there's a big difference between hearing and hearing with understanding. To judge thy people that I may discern between good and bad, between right and wrong, which was one of the, being the judge of the people was one of the duties of the king. For who is able to judge this so great a people? Didn't ask anything for himself, which, you know, that would be pleasing to God just as it would be pleasing to a father. You know, if you have two, two sons, for example, and you see one of the siblings doing something good for the other or, or sharing something with them. It makes you proud. It, it pleases you. And, and that's just the way God felt about Solomon because we're all his children. And, and when you do something for anybody, it's doing something for one of his children. And again, Solomon didn't ask for anything for himself but asked for wisdom so that he could judge God's people. And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. 
Solomon utilized wisdom in asking for wisdom. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment, so he could judge Israel. Soon after, Solomon would prove this wisdom that God had given him. You remember the two women that were living under the same roof, and each of them had an infant son, and one of them lay on her son and suffocated it. And what did she do the next morning? She got up and took the other one's son and said, this is my son. And so there was a dispute, and they brought the dispute before Solomon, and Solomon said, I'll settle this, bring me a sword. I'll cut the infant in half and give half to each. And the wisdom of God was with him. And he knew that the real mother would rather give up her son than to have her son slain and split in half. So God did give Solomon wisdom beyond normal. Verse 12. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, Neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. And it impressed the queen of Sheba. You remember she came to, to she said, I heard about the, how wise you were. And now that I've been here, I didn't hear half of how great your wisdom is. The wisest of all, with one exception that in the flesh, that of course being Jesus Christ. Verse 13 And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. And this is not just the kings of Israel and Judah, it's the kings of the world. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Jesus would say, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and I will add all these things unto you. In an earlier verse there in Matthew chapter 6, verse 27, Jesus says, Which of you can add one cubit to his stature by thinking about it? And that doesn't translate very well. What he's saying is you can't add one moment to your life by thinking on it. You don't control that. God controls how long we each have in the flesh body. And you know what? That's just fine with me. You know, uh, and more on that in a minute. Verse 14, and if, here we have a condition, if thou wilt walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as thy father David did walk, then I will lengthen thy days. And Solomon didn't note the condition. In his older years, elder years, Solomon got away into idolatry. He, he had, what, 700 wives and 300 concubines? That's scary to think about. But there were a lot of them were foreign, and he allowed them to bring their gods to Jerusalem. They built altars to them on, on, on Mount Zion and, and, and uh, the, the Mount of Olives, and he started worshiping their gods. And so uh, he didn't note the condition. As I said, God rewards doing things His way with long life. And, but you know what? He doesn't promise that that's going to be a piece of cake. He, he doesn't uh, make it easy. Uh, getting old, as Pastor Arnold Murray used to always say, ain't for sissies. Turn with me to Ecclesiastes. You've got the Psalms, and then you've got Proverbs, and then you've got Ecclesiastes, written by the preacher, Solomon himself. Written to man that walks under the sun. And you know, everything in the flesh comes to an end. It's temporary, beloved. You don't want to go into the eternity in your flesh because the flesh is temporary. 
Let's pick it up, chapter 12, verse 1. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days or the hard bad days come not, nor the years draw nigh. The the years that we uh, are no longer in the flesh draw nigh. When thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. I, I don't have any pleasure in life anymore. The aches and pains have gotten to me. Verse 2. While the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain. Verse 3. In the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble, the the servants of the house have become so old that they, they themselves tremble. And the strong men shall bow themselves. In the books of Proverbs, it's written that uh, the strength of a young man is his beauty. But the hoary head, that means the gray hair of an old man, is his beauty. Shall bow themselves. And the grinders cease because they are few. The teeth just don't work like they used to. And those that look out the windows be darkened. They don't see so good anymore in their old age. And the doors shall be shut in the streets when the sound of the grinding is low. The teeth, uh, again, gone. Not as many grinders to grind with. And he shall rise up at the voice of the bird. He's got a little bit of insomnia. Can't sleep good at night. And all the daughters of music shall be brought low. The hearing starts to give out in our old age. Maybe there's a supplement that we'll get in a promotion in the mail advertising that will help some of these things. Verse 5. Also, when they shall be afraid of that which is high. Boy, that rings true with me. Back when I was in my 20s. Man, I could scamper up a ladder and balance on one foot and change a light bulb and think nothing of it. Now when I have to climb up three steps on the ladder to change the battery and the smoke detector, I'm hanging on for dear life and my knees are shaking. Fears shall be in the way. That's what's in the way of climbing up that ladder. You fear falling because if you fall, you know you're going to break something and it's going to take a long time to heal because when you get older, that's the way it is. And the almond tree shall flourish. This really doesn't cut it in the translation. This, if you have a companion Bible, you have a note on this. This means that, that the gray, the hoary hairs become even thinner and thinner to the point that You're bald. You're balding, in other words, is what this means. And the grasshopper shall be a burden. Just a little grasshopper is a burden for you to pick up and carry. And desire shall fail. Maybe there's a supplement for that. Because man goeth to his long home. In the Hebrew, this is olam, eternity, the flesh, the grave is where the flesh goes. And the mourners go about the streets. Verse 6, or ever the silver cord be loosed, or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the sister. And these are all Hebraisms, figures of speech that mean when we die, when the flesh dies. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. And as we learn in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. That's the reason that we as Christians, we as believers, don't have to sweat being another year older. We know what happens when the flesh dies. It goes back to the earth from which it came. Our spirit returns to our Heavenly Father. Turn with me back to the book of Proverbs. God speaks of wisdom and longevity in the book of Proverbs. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs. 
Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1. God speaking to Solomon and, and you and, and me as well. My son, forget not my law, the Lord speaking, but let thine heart keep my commandments. This word keep means to, to hedge about or guard about as, as protecting something precious. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. God's instructions fix problems if we do things his way. And, and there's a bit of a promise there. And you know what? If I had my choice of living a long life in the flesh that never saw any peace, constant turmoil, constant bickering, arguing, fighting, which would you rather do? Would you rather live a shorter life that was sweet and, and you had some peace? I'd take the shorter life myself. But here he promises length of days and long life and peace if we do what? If we keep his commandments and guard about them in our hearts. Verse 3. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee or escape you. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. Can also be translated mind. And what this is saying is focus on God's word. It, it fixes problems in the flesh. Verse 4. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding. This could be translated good success in the sight of God and man. You want to be successful? Do things God's way. Receive his blessings. The reason we came here, sharpen up for me, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. Realize that there's one salvation. That cloning and cryopreservation are of man's own understanding. Don't lean on your men's understanding. Lean on God. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Verse 6. In all thy ways acknowledge him, recognize him, and he shall direct thy paths. You know, some people go through life without a clue what direction they should take. They don't understand why it is we're even here in the flesh. What is the, the purpose of all this? You, on the other hand, are blessed because you have been given eyes to see and ears to hear. You know what way to go, and that's God's way. That's the difference between being successful and not being successful. The choice is yours. Verse 7, be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear or revere the Lord and depart from evil. In this same book, chapter 1, verse 7, we learn that the fear or reverence of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge, and fools despise instruction. Verse 7, all right, we got that. Verse 8, it shall be health. You could translate this, it shall be medicine to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. And you think to yourself, navel? You know, and I guess it depends on whether you've got an insy or an outsy. But to me, it appears the only thing that a navel is good for is to collect lint or dust if you have an insy. But let me ask you this. When you were an infant, more earlier than that, when you were an embryo in your mother's womb, how important was that navel? <laughs> it was pretty darn important, right? All of your substance came, substance, sustenance, I'll get it out here in a minute, came through that navel. So uh, it certain, depends on what part of your life you're in, the navel can be very important. Verse 9, honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. Give, give the Lord 
his due. How do we know what he's due? By studying his word, by studying the law. Verse 10. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. This is the promise of Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. God says through Malachi, his, the prophet there, bring in the tithes so that there may be meat in my house, God speaking. And if you'll do that, I'll open up a window from heaven and pour out such a blessing on you that you won't have room to hold it. That's, that's the promise. Can you claim it? Verse 11, My son despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. Remember, this is wisdom speaking. And when God chastises you, first thing, realize that he loves you. Because we learn in the next verse and in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6, God only chastens those that he loves. I hope he loves me. I know you feel the same way or you wouldn't uh, serve him and do the work that you do for him. But when he chastens you, when he spanks you a little bit, and we'll put this in a, a term that we understand in the flesh, because it, it states there in Hebrews too, what father in the flesh, if you love your child, you correct them. If you, if you don't correct them, what happens? You're, you're going to have a little monster on your hand. Not any discipline and doesn't have any respect for what is right or wrong. So uh, very important. Uh, let him chasten you when he chooses to. Uh, then pick yourself up by the bootstraps. Straighten yourself out. Get your act together and get on with serving the Lord. Verse 12, for whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father, the son in whom he delighteth. Again, Hebrews chapter 12, a second witness to that. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. For the merchandise, this is sakar in the Hebrew, it means profit. If you read it that way, for the profit of it, of wisdom, is better than the merchandise or the profit of silver and the gain thereof than fine gold. You know, if a fool inherits a lot of gold and silver, what's likely going to happen? He's going to lose it because he's a fool. But wisdom, on the other hand, you can gain wealth with it. Why? We learned about you can be successful. You have good understanding in verse 4 in the sight of God and man. Verse 15, she. Here God chooses to describe women, or I should say wisdom, in the feminine. I don't think that needs any explanation, does it? She referring to wisdom, is more precious than rubies. And all the things thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her. A wisdom allows us to do what is right. It allows us to receive God's blessings and be successful. Verse 16, length of days is in her right hand. The power of length of days is in her right hand. And in her left hand, riches and honor. Wisdom brings riches and longevity. If you have a companion Bible note too, there's a, a note on this that this does not necessarily mean length of days as extending your flesh life. It means everything good is in wisdom's hand to give to you. Verse 17, her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. And again, give me a short life that has a good dose of peace in it over a long life that's filled with controversy and strife any day. Let's go to, we're, we're talking about whether we should fear death or not. 
and, and I choose at this point to, to take you to the Psalms, Psalm 23. This is probably one of the most mistaught psalms. Uh, many people refer to it as a psalm of death. It's not a psalm of death. Psalm 22, if you want a psalm of death, that's a psalm of death. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And the crucifixion of Christ described down to the Roman soldiers, gambling, casting lots for his clothing, his apparel. Psalm 23, on the other hand, is known and properly known as the resurrection psalm. Let's go with Psalm 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I, don't, I won't need, for, I won't lack anything. And, and what does a shepherd do? Well, a shepherd waters the flock. He makes sure that the flock has plenty to eat. He feeds the flock. He protects the flock. And, and he is the good shepherd. Verse 2, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures, tender and choice lush pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. The question is, do you follow? It's written in John chapter 10 verse 14. Jesus there says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and I am known of them. Verse 3, he restoreth my soul. He leadeth me, he guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And if you call yourself a Christian, that applies to you as well. If you follow his lead, he shows you the right way. The reason we came here and the reason we should not fear death, verse 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And that's how this gets the rap as being the death psalm. But notice it doesn't say, I was going through the, the valley and I stopped and died there. That's not what it says. I went through the valley of the shadow of death. And how can we go through the valley of the shadow of death? By believing on Jesus Christ, having Him as our personal Savior. Verse 5, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. And when you are anointed, God said, Touch not mine anointed. He protects the anointed as the apple of his eye. That's the pupil of his eye. And the cup runneth over, you runs over with knowledge. Joy uh, beyond description. Verse 6, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And you know what? When we dwell in the house of the Lord forever, do you need a flesh body to do that? No, Paul taught us, and we're going to go there, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of God. So why would someone want to clone themselves with the thought of having eternal life? In closing, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And kind of to set this up, I'm not going to cover as much of this as I had originally intended, but Paul does a really good job of teaching us that we have two bodies, starting along about verse 35. And, and he teaches the, the following, that we have a celestial body, a spiritual body, and a terrestrial body, a, a flesh body, if you will. Let's go with verse 50 as we conclude our study on another year older. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. The flesh must die before the spiritual body steps out 
And that's only, the only the spiritual body can enter the kingdom of God. It's, you know, we talk about dimensions, that, that we can't see into that dimension. And I don't believe that unless God allows it on specific and special occasions, allows them to see into this dimension. Verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. Oh, I like mysteries. We shall not all sleep. This means die. But we shall all be changed. And you know, the, the 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through about 18 probably some of the most mistaught scripture in God's word. They take that and make the rapture out of it. When the subject, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, is very clear. Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant as the heathen are concerning where are those who sleep, those who are dead. But here we learn that for those who are still alive in the flesh, as it states there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, until Christ returns, you're not going to die. You're, we're going to gather together in a cloud, that means a large group, and meet Him in the air. That's spirit. Verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, that's the seventh trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead, this is the spiritually dead, shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. This change is very graphically described in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 53. For this corruptible, or perishable, that's the flesh, must put on incorruption. And this mortal, that's liable to die, must put on immortality. You want immortality? That's the way you get immortality, the spirit. So when this corruptible, that's the flesh body, shall have put on incorruption, the spiritual, and this mortal, the liable to die, shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. And this uh, pertains first of all to God's elect, those who participate in the first resurrection of Revelation chapter 20. This death is swallowed up in victory, quoted from Isaiah chapter 25, verse 8. Verse 55, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? And the grave and death have no victory over our spiritual bodies. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's the only thing that goes into the grave is your flesh body. Your spirit does not go into the grave. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. 57, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He gave us the victory, not uh, some scientist who came up with cloning or cryogenics, one way to salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 58 to conclude, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Does that say in the faith? No, in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You know, Christ came to this earth to defeat death, as it's written in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. And don't overlook that last verse, though. While we are here in the flesh, there's work to do. Remember we talked earlier about when we do something nice for one of God's children, and that's everybody, that it pleases him? That's the work that we have before us, beloved, is getting God's Word out. You know, this sounds very simple to you because you have eyes to see and ears to hear. But, beloved, there are thousands, millions out there who haven't had a chance to hear truth. They don't know how to be successful in life. 
They don't know how to obtain immortality. You do and share that with others. That's the work that he has for us to do that pleases him when we do it. Let's go to his throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your written word, Father. It is indeed a pleasure to serve you. We thank you for the opportunity to serve you. Uh, continue to reveal your word, Father, to this group. We ask you to continue to, to open our eyes and, and our ears, Father, to be attuned to your will, Father. That's what's important in these final days is your will, not our own self-will. We're always careful to give you the praise. We pray for our military troops who are in harm's way around the world, Father. We ask you to watch over, uh, guide, direct. In Yeshua Jesus' precious name, amen. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. ...with the Word of God. Concerning the two witnesses... Who has the brass to slay them, considering they are God's anointed? If it's the Antichrist, why would he fulfill God's prophecy knowing Jesus returns three days after they are slain? Well, it's written that that happens, Revelation chapter 11, verse 7. When they have finished their testimony, uh, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit uh, that's pretty boy Floyd, the Antichrist, shall make war and overcome them, the two witnesses, and kill them. Uh, they'll lay in that street, uh, the pata, the open area, better than street, as it states in Revelation chapter 11. And uh, three days later, though, uh, as they ascend up, uh, up and, and resurrect, in other words, uh, Jesus descends, and that's when his feet hit the, the Mount of Olives, as it's written in Acts chapter 2 and Zechariah chapter 14, and the second advent begins. I say, come, Lord Jesus, come. I'm beginning to think that he's the only one that can straighten this world out. Helen from Georgia, my question is, are the families that live together and have not gotten married, as with on paper, and they have children also. Are they living in sin and are the children illegitimate? This is something you cannot talk about, but a Bible scholar can. So I would like to know on this. Thank you. And okay, we can address that. You know, most people, and I know where you're going with this illegitimate children, uh, most people uh, think of the word bastard as it appears in the Old Testament as illegitimate children, meaning that the mother and the father weren't married on paper, as you uh, so aptly put, uh, and that is a bastard. That's not true. If you'll take the word bastard, uh, look it up in your Strong's Concordance, you'll find that it points you to a Hebrew word, uh, mamsar. And you'll find, if you read the, the, what a mamzar is, it's a child of, of one parent of one race, another parent of another race. Uh, that's all I'll say on it. You know, when children are a possibility, we recommend here at the chapel that the parents obtain uh, legal, a civil license. Why? Uh, because it protects the rights of the children. Uh, and uh, that's all I'll say on that. Bill in West Virginia, I've never agreed with you on the fact that you say don't 
you don't have to be baptized using there on the cross. I guess you're talking about the male factor. Jesus was still alive. His will had not yet taken place. He was still alive. Well, okay, Bill, we, you know, we can still be friends, but that's one area that we'll have to uh, agree to disagree. Charlene, you know, most people who say that you have to be baptized are pointing to the book of St. John, chapter 3, uh, what is it, verse 5, I believe, that states you have to be born of water. And it's not talking about that you have to be baptized there. It's talking about you have to be born of woman. What happens when a child is born, the first thing, the water breaks. That's what born of water means, born in the flesh, as opposed to to enter the kingdom of God, as opposed to those who refuse to be born of woman. I'm talking about the fallen angels of Genesis chapter 6, and they came to earth. They saw the daughters of Adam. They liked what they saw. They went into them, and the result was children that are called Geber. Those were the giants. Charlene and they do not have the, the Nephilim, the fallen angels, uh, will not enter the kingdom of God as it's written in Jude chapter 1 verse 6 because they refused to be born a woman and they left their habitation in, with God and came to earth. Charlene in Tennessee, <clears throat> first of all I want to say God bless you and your staff. Well thank you for that. Let me get down to your question and thank you for your kind comments. Uh, question, could you please explain Matthew chapter 24 verses 45 and 46 and there it's talking about a faithful and wise servant whom the Lord will make ruler uh, over his whole house to give them uh, meat in due season. Now think spiritual on that and what he's talking about is as opposed to those who uh, go to church every Sunday and hear the same salvation message over and over and over um, as opposed to those who are ready to get into God's, to sink their teeth in to more in God's Word and those who are ready for meat, not milk. Uh, Paul taught well on this subject in the book of Hebrews chapter 5 verse 12. Paul said there, you know, when it's time that you ought to be teaching others you are still in need of milk. You're not ready for meat of God's Word. You still need to go back and, and pick up the first oracles of God, which are salvation, over and over and over. Paul in Arkansas. Can you clarify why so many people are failing this age if they made it in the first earth age? Aren't these the same people who were chosen to make it to this age? Is it because of Satan? Well, you're confused. Everyone, is God's plan was to be born in the flesh. It wasn't those who uh, did something special in the first earth age. You're talking about God's elect, and there are a lot more people on earth today than just God's election. Um, the reason for this, the second earth age, is that God did not want to destroy a third of his children that followed Satan in the first earth and heaven age. They have a chance at salvation uh, here in the second uh, earth and heaven age. God's elect, on the other hand, participate in the first resurrection of Revelation chapter 20 verses 5 through 6, uh, most of those who don't make it, as you put it, in this earth and heaven age, it doesn't mean that they're destroyed forever and ever. It means that they're spiritually dead. Uh, they will remain spiritually dead, as it states there in Revelation chapter 20, through the thousand years, the millennium. At the end of that is the great white throne judgment. At that point, God judges them to uh, the eternity, uh, which those who participate in the first resurrection are already a part of, 
or to go with Satan into the lake of fire. Felicia from Florida, bless your church. Well, thank you for that and bless you for the love of the Lord Jesus Christ and his word and truth. I have, I love my family for the sake of Jesus' love to show my family that God loves us. Some of them I feel evil presence when they come to my home. I feel uncomfortable with their presence. I ask them to stay away, but they keep coming. Please give me some advice on how to handle them. I feel the Lord Jesus Christ will uh, be straightening it out with love and ask for his help uh, to straighten it out. But what I would do, Felicia, is anoint your home with oil, olive oil. Uh, you can obtain olive oil at any grocery store, uh, set aside a little bit in a vial, uh, and, and ask God in prayer to bless that oil. And then you anoint your home by placing some on the doorpost. You order all negative evil out of your home. And, you know, it's your home. What goes on under that roof is under your control. And if you have people that need to stay away, make them stay away. If that means calling the cops and putting an order on them, that's what you do to, to maintain control of your house. Way out of time. I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word in depth. And you know, we are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. One thing that's most important, beloved, and it's this, is stay in His Word every day. Every day in your Father's Word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you.